So we're starting with a, uh, this is a self-portrait by uh, Rembrandt. <laughs> I, don't, I don't look that good, so, uh, <clears throat> but, it, and I'm the re you'll, find, you'll, you'll understand the reason that I'm starting with this, because I wanted you to see, it's a self-portrait Rembrandt painted in the 1600s. And um, you see the clothes he has on, and you kind of get an idea of the clothing of the time. It's all flowery and full and all of that, you know, and uh, this is, you know, in Holland, so that was their particular culture. And, um, and, and, and he, he painted in the 1600s, and, so, and there were other painters at that time, too, that are famous, and they, they, made, they, they painted some biblical themes, biblical uh, scenes that we would all be able to understand. But it's interesting how the people are dressed and what things look like in those pictures. For instance, this is a picture by Nicholas Mays from 1634. It's uh, Abraham dismissing Hagar and Ishmael. And you notice that they have... Um, You notice their clothing is very much like Rembrandt's clothing. And, uh, and then, you know, the buildings are European buildings. All right. And the question is, why did they paint scenes like this? Yes, that's a real biblical scene, but I doubt this is how Abraham and, and Hagar and Ishmael looked in, as far as how they dressed and where they were at. You go on, this is, uh, this is Jacob blessing uh, Ephraim and Manasseh. And, um, you know, there are several flaws with this. You know, who's this? And, um, you, know, who, you know, that may be Joseph, I guess. But you notice, again, the bedding and everything is like that of 16th, you know, 17th century um, uh, Holland. And, uh, and the the question is, why did they paint biblical scenes like they did? You look at this again. It looks like Holland of the time. And the question is, why did they paint biblical scenes like this? They, um, they're, not, they're not accurate portrayals of the Bible at all. That's not how people dressed at, at that time. In, in fact, we can see from Rembrandt's, Rembrandt's self-portrait that Rembrandt was using clothing and other items that were common to the 1600s, rather than 1700 B.C., the time of Abraham, 1400 B.C., the time of the Israelites, or 100 A.D., you know, the time of the Apostle John. So why did Rembrandt choose to portray biblical characters in this way? Well, the reason was because he had no clue about the dress and the customs of the people living in the time of Abraham or any of the biblical characters. They had no clue how they dressed, no clue what their customs were. He painted what he knew. A fellow by the name of Randall Price in a book called The Stones Cry Out said, now Rembrandt couldn't have known how to paint a Mesopotamian Abraham and Sarah or an Egyptian Hagar living in a Canaanite setting. He had no reference for his art outside of his era. Archaeology changed that forever by providing both artist and spectator an accurate view of the original setting. Relief sculptures from the Mesopotamian palaces, Canaanite pottery and artifacts and painted murals from the Egyptian tombs dating from the patriarchal period have now made uh, these biblical figures come alive. So I thought it would be worthwhile here to talk about archaeology in the Bible and uh, we're not going to get into too much depth on it, but just kind of look at some overview things this time and then look at some of the, uh, arche the archaeological finds that I think are encouraging to all of us who have a belief in the Bible. The word archaeology is a compound word from the Greek word archaeos and uh, logos. Uh, those two words are joined together to make archaeology, and they, they mean the study of ancient things. All right, so archaeology is not just biblical. That's a specific area in archaeology, but archaeology just covers the whole field because you have 
all sorts of artifacts all over the world, different cultures and civilizations. The early uh, Greeks and Romans and Jews used the term in, term in, the, in their discussions of history, and uh, it appears that Bishop Hall of Norwich used archaeologia in English for the first time in 1607. So in modern times, when we speak of archaeology in general, we're referring to the discipline typically within the field of anthropology and history that draws upon the, an investigation of current material remains in order to understand past customs, cultures, and civilizations. These remains include pottery, graves, buildings, coins, tools, weapons, clothing, jewelry, literature, inscriptions, and more. Archaeology of the Bible exists as a specific field of inquiry within this discipline. Its primary goal is the excavation of areas associated with the Bible and its societies and cultures. The question is, does archaeology matter? Does it matter? Think of the, I'd just like to quote from a fellow named Harry Orlinsky. He wrote uh, uh, what, what I'm going to read in, the, in a magazine called Bible and Spade, uh, and this is from back in 1975. And you have, to, you have to realize we accept the Bible as true, all right? It's true. And if it said something happened in here, it happened. If it said that a nation existed, it said a, a, a king existed or whatever, it's true, all right? However, you have to realize that there are a lot of people who don't believe that at all. And this Harry Orlinsky helps, helps to explain that. He says, The destruction of Solomon's temple and the Babylonian exile are two events that we all take for granted. You know, Solomon's temple was destroyed by the Babylonians in 586 B.C. and, Solomon's, uh, and, and uh, the people were taken into exile at that time. And they were in exile, and then they returned to the land of, of, of promise. And we take them for granted. You may wonder what it is about the destruction and exile that we need archaeology for. Everyone knows about these events. Everyone knows that Solomon's temple was destroyed and a Babylonian captivity followed. So archaeology can play but a relatively minor role here. However, when I started out as a college student in Semitics, Semitics in the, in the 20s and 30s, the destruction and the exile had come to be increasingly regarded by serious scholars as fictitious as recently as the 1920s and 30s. My teacher at the University of Toronto, Professor, Professor Theophile Mike, or excuse, Meek, Theophile Meek, a person of very considerable knowledge and integrity, used to gloss over this period because he didn't feel entirely secure with the data for it. The, the evidence, see, the, they, what they saw is the Bible says this happened, but we can't find any evidence for it. So they could not find anything in the archaeological record that would back up that these events actually took place. So they considered them to be myths, basically. So... Um, the evidence for the destruction of Solomon's temple and the Babylonian captivity and the evidence for the return to, to Judah and its restoration were all rather unsubstantial. Simply because the Bible related these events was hardly enough assurance for a scholar that these events had actually taken place. Just a few decades ago in the 30s, there, there developed a group of scholars in this country and in Europe, all outstanding and serious scholars who are writing very bluntly that, they, that there never was a significant destruction of Solomon's temple or of, or of Judah as a whole. Consequently, there was, not great meaningful cap, was no great meaningful captivity, no widespread captivity in Babylonia, Babylonia, and therefore there was no restoration to Judah since there was nothing to restore. The whole event was essentially fiction. Now, that's not uh, the, the opinion of scholars today, no matter how wild they choose to be. Why? Because archaeology, since the 20s and 30s, had abundantly proven there was a captivity and restoration. That's why all archaeology is an important tool. You see, the, just, you have to realize that many people 
question the Exodus as an example. And that's why many times as you study the subject, you go in and you look at historical works, they will tell you that this all took place in the 1200s, which is impossible. Couldn't have happened then. They don't believe in the Exodus. They find no evidence of Israel coming into Canaan and taking over. They mention all these different cities and things that supposedly took place there. They can't find evidence for it. All right, so you have to realize, uh, and, and uh, the, the exodus is a, a controversial issue even today, uh, and, uh, and there are points against it, and then there are also points that support it. So you've got to put the two together. And we, I believe in the Bible that that's exactly what took place. And uh, so I, I look for confirmation of the Bible as opposed to it never happened until you can prove it. So, um, anyway, but archaeology is quite interesting, and, uh, and, and I think it encur- will be encouraging to us as we find some things about it. Let's talk about, so, this is uh, methodology. So, methodology, how, uh, you know, how do, they, how do archaeologists operate? If we're to understand how archaeology can be used properly to make a contribution of our understanding of the Bible, we have to understand its methods especially how they arrive at chronological dates. So to say that, that Solomon's temple was completed in 960, or I forget whether it was completed or began in 960 B.C. How do you know that date's solid? Which it is. And it, and it talks about 430 years before this point in time, which brings us back to the time when the... Um, uh, when Israel came into, uh, came into the land. It says if we, if we are to understand how archaeology can be used, we have to understand its methodology and how they arrive at dates. What methods do they use to do that? And the limitation with archaeological procedures and, and methods. Uh, the limitations of, our, you know, there is a limitation to what archaeology can do. And uh, we have to keep that in the back of our minds and, uh, and realize that archaeology helps, but it's not the total answer. So we can, uh, and we have to realize as we talk about uh, reading uh, somebody that's supposedly a biblical scholar, uh, just because they're a great scholar doesn't mean they believe in the Bible. Many of them don't. And uh, it doesn't mean they're going to be helpful to us. We have to be careful in how we assess things. So how do they go about their work? Well, it's a lot of digging and scraping and dusting and all of that. Uh, The procedural definition of archaeology is the systematic recovery of surviving remains of ancient civilizations. (coughs) So what kind, you know, we want to find out the analysis and interpretation of those remains in an effort to reconstruct material civilization. So what were things like back then? So what kind of houses did they live in? What kind of tools, weapons, transportation? What was their social structure like? The values of, of uh, religion, their social customs, their legal matters of ancient society. So what they do is try to go through and find the things in the most systematic way that they can so everything is lying where it was originally found and all of that. So they try to be scientific in that way. And um, as they put all this together, they dig all these things up, that's all the science. And then once they dig it all up, then they've got to become creative. And this is where the art side of archaeology comes in. They have to try to figure out, okay, how do all these things fit together and what do they tell us about the people who once lived here? And uh, some of that does take some creativity in order to do that. So how do we find ancient remains? How do we find ancient remains? This is a, you know, if you happen to live in this area, this hill is not a natural hill. Okay, it doesn't, it, you know, the way it, the way it rises up is not natural. In fact, uh, it's the remains of Lakish. Uh, okay, so uh, there, there, and uh, Lakish is a city that was destroyed by the Babylonians and, uh, and we've recounted before. In order to recover ancient remains, you have to find them. You have to find where the people lived in ancient times, 
Otherwise, you aren't going to find much other than what's discovered by accident or you know, as you wander around the landscape. So what archeologists do is look for the remains of ancient cities. Now in the Middle East, the places where those ancient cities once existed are called tells. So this is a tell. This is a tell and you can always uh, tell a tell because it's a hill which doesn't look natural. Its uh, contours are irregular and even, even covered with vegetation, it doesn't uh, look na like a natural hill. And uh, so they, they have to uh, first find the place where the people live. And uh, as this is an aerial view, and sometimes as you fly around, you can fly in an area and you'll be able to notice things from the air that you wouldn't if you were on the ground. For instance, in finding some of the ancient parts of Ashkelon, it, just looking at it on the ground, it, there are dunes there, and they just, dunes, big deal. But once you go up in the air, you see that they're perpendicular to one another, which tells you that that's not a natural occurrence. Multiple places where these dunes are perpendicular tells you that there is an, probably an ancient habitation there. So you, by flying around, can see certain things that <clears throat> you wouldn't see other, otherwise. And this is uh, Tel Yachniam, where it, which is a, a city up in the, uh, uh, the Valley of Jezreel. But they've been able to find these places which don't fit in with the surroundings and been able to begin excavating them archaeologically to find artifacts and learn more about the people that live there. Sometimes you can uh, look, look for a name. And, uh, and if there's a name that is similar to a biblical name, it helps you to be able to, de to determine, well, this might be a good place to... Uh, to begin an archaeological dig. Uh, the, you know, if the name is still the same, that's very helpful, but that's not always the case. If it's still a living place and the name hasn't changed, for example, for example, Jerusalem, it's an ancient place. Its name is still there. So you, you're pretty, you have a pretty good possibility of finding artifacts in Jerusalem since it's been around for a while. A number of other places that still bear ancient, bear ancient names, Athens, Corinth, Rome, they're still in existence. Often, uh, often places change their names. Uh, different peoples come in and take over different cultures, different language, and they change the name. But often, if they, often you know, even though they change the name, there are clues that remain. For instance, a place, there's a place in Iraq called Babel. Where do you think that might be? Might be uh, Babylon? Oh, and uh, in Israel, we have uh, the ancient city called Mukmas in Arabic. What would that be in the Bible? Might it be Mikmash? And an uh, Arabic town called Jeba, uh, which is the biblical town of Geba. And you have a, today a place called Tarata, which uh, is the biblical Chorazin. So they're, they're still around, but you've got to try to figure out where they were. Just an interesting story about n the name and, and it leading to archaeological finds. There was a man uh, named uh, Le uh, Layard. He was a, an Englishman, and um, he was passionately interested in ancient things. So he wanted to um, go out and uh, find these ancient things. He wanted to go to the Middle East and dig, dig up things. He came from a good family, but he didn't have uh, a whole lot of money, so he didn't have enough to go out and, on a self-financed expedition. So he did the next best thing, which was to, to join the British Public Service, or Foreign Service, and he managed with his family connections to get a post in Iraq. So, um, and that gave him a lot of time between his official duties, which were not so, uh, too onerous, to go running around looking at ancient sites. And he particularly wanted to find one ancient site, a site which all of his contemporaries told him never existed. It was a figment of his imagination, uh, and, and a figment of uh, the imagination of the Hebrew writers. Yes, they wrote about it, but it never existed. This was part of their the uh, Israelite mythology. He was convinced that it did, did exist, and he was going to find it. 
So he was going about the land, and he would ask the locals the names of this mound or that mound, and he knew that if the city truly existed, it would be a big mound. And he found a very big mound, but after finding out the local name, he concluded that was not what he was looking for. The large mound had no connection with ancient, the ancient place. He was about to leave when he noticed nearby a small mound. And, he, and just for the sake of conversation, he asked about the other smaller mound, which, in his range of, which was in his range of view. And he was told of the mound, or tell, was the mound of the prophet Eunice, Nebi Eunice. And Nebi means prophet in Arabic. So who, who might Nebi Eunice be? Well, chills went down uh, Layard's spine, and because what would you do with Eunice to bring it to, into Hebrew? Just as the Arabic J uh, sound is G in Hebrew, the Y sound in Arabic is often similar to a J uh, sound in English because there is no J sound in Hebrew. So who is being referred to here? Well, he concluded it very probably could be the prophet Jonah. And Jonah went to what city? The city of Nineveh. And uh, you can see why chills went up and down his spine, because he'd been looking for the city of Nineveh. So here, right by this big mound, was a little mound that was by local tradition called the Mound of the Prophet Jonah. Maybe then it meant that the big mound was Nineveh. And remember Jonah, when he finished his mission, he went outside the city and sat down a short distance away and waited for God to hopefully destroy it. At least in his mind, God taught him a few lessons along the way. We don't know whether he learned the lessons at the end because the book ends rather abruptly. The British Foreign Service man, archaeologist, got excited, got a permit, and began working. And sure enough, the large mound was Nineveh. He, more than anyone else, helped establish the fact that the Assyrians really existed. They weren't just figments of the biblical writers. See, that's the, the mindset many times of the critical scholars. They see the, the prophets and the writers of the Bible as just creating myth. Hey, let's write this down. It sounds good. It's going to make us look good. We can pass it along as tr a tradition. And that's where they come from. And they're just completely wrong, and they don't... And none of it's right. But you see, from this particular example, people doubted the existence of the Assyrians, and here you can see that they did exist. Now, sometimes, as you're looking at, at for a place, you can actually go to the Bible and look at what the Bible has to say, and it can help you determine where a location is. For instance, Judges chapter 21, verse 19 says, Then they said, In fact... There is a yearly feast of the Lord, Lord in Shiloh, which is north of Bethel on the east side of the highway that goes up from Bethel to Shechem and south of Labona. So right here's Bethel. Here's the road. It goes up all the way to Shechem. And whatever this, and this particular place is uh, north of Bethel. It's going to be on the east side of the highway that goes goes up from Bethel to Shechem. So this is the east side of the highway, and here's Labona, and it's south of Labona. So they, they were able to take that information from the Bible and have a fairly good idea of where Shiloh was. And, able to, and, but, and that's right directly from the Bible. So when you have the Bible describe something like that, and you're able to go there and find it, does that establish that the Bible is a, revival, a reliable account of what actually took place and where locations were? And um, sometimes you can have, you know, you can have a, a, a scripture like this or a description. Sometimes you can have a geographic location, which is helpful to you. So let's say that you found the place. You found a place. You've looked after it. You've you've searched for it, and uh, you want to uh, establish a uh, get a dig going. So what are you going to do here? So you found the place and uh, you want to dig things up. And, and this is an area where archaeology has matured considerably. Because when they're, <clears throat> let's say that Layard found these artifacts at Nineveh. 
And maybe he found some, you know, things that are tr treasures, truly treasures. So what do you think everybody, humanly, what are human beings going to do when they hear about this? It's, uh, what, they're going to all go out, just like the gold rush, and they're all going to start digging, hoping they hit the jackpot. And that's, to a large extent, what took place in the early years of archaeology. Everybody that had a shovel and could get to those ancient locations, they were out there digging away, seeing what they could find. And uh, so that, that's why the, uh, the, the particular field has, has matured considerably, because they stopped doing that. They actually go through a, a very careful process to find specimens and, uh, and look for things now so that they don't just destroy everything around. And um, <clears> then <throat> they've advanced to a specific method, one of which is called the trench method. You see that shown here. They start digging a trench in an area where they're looking for archaeological finds. So they they begin digging and they dig very carefully and, and take the earth out and they take it over to a screen and they shake it out to see if they can find things with the, from in the dirt. And then they begin going along and if you find things in the wall of the, of the trench, then you know where they are at and what they are. And you're very careful to preserve them and to take pictures and make sure you keep everything in, in an organized way. So you dig a trench all the way down the side of the hill through every layer of the site and you, you cut through it like a layer cake. So you know you go through and you cut through the cake and you go through each of the layers. Uh, this message lets, uh, lets them sample all the various layers, but what's the weakness of this particular method? The problem is that the layers are not like the layers of a cake. Some layers don't go, all, go across the whole tell. And uh, they may not be present in your trench, and therefore other methods had to be devised to more carefully chronicle each section of the um, of a tell. This another method is called the Wheeler Kenyon method. You take your site and you take selected point portions of your site, and you divide it up into squares, five meters by five meters. And even when you find things, you leave the walls separating the square. You maintain the grid because it allows you to pinpoint the position of everything you find. And when you find it, you take a picture of the find in, in the hole exactly where you found it. Uh, archaeologists have come to see that it is better not to excavate the whole site. Leave something for other people who might come along with better methods and they can check your work and uh, correct it if necessary. As you... Um, so this is a site, you can see the walls between the areas they've excavated there. And they leave those walls there because it uh, gives them reference points. And uh, you can check uh, what, you know, what you've done as you dig through. Frequently when excavating, you might, find, uh, might dig one part of the square to a lower depth uh, called a probe trench. And because you're probing to see what might be underneath. Uh, and it will help you to discern whether to go down fast or slowly. Detailed me measurements must be taken to chronicle where objects were found, and records are, records are kept daily of what is found in each square. Drawings are made of walls and the architectural features, and this is done because as one goes down in the excavation, uh, you are dis destroying you know, other things. So photographs are taken, specimens pre preserved, and they're compared to known uh, samples. Now, this is, now, let's say you find things here. You find whatever it may be, architecture, coins, uh, pottery, all those things you find here, then, then it becomes challenging because what does all of it mean? It's called interpretation. And it's the most difficult area and, uh, where, and where science becomes mostly art. Uh, written documents are invaluable. Uh, documents from 5,000 years ago that are still readable are most precious because there aren't a lot of them around. Uh, it helps to understand the values and motives of the ancient people, and written documents tell you uh, these things uh, best. For instance, as you look at this next uh, 
This is a written document. It's called the Cyrus Cylinder. Now, why is it, does anybody know why the Cyrus Cylinder is, is important? Uh, to help you turn to Ezra chapter 1. Ezra chapter 1. Ezra chapter 1, verse 1. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing, saying, Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, all the kingdoms of the earth the Lord God of heaven has given to me. And he has commanded me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah, who, is, who among you of all his people may his God be with him and let them, him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord, God of Israel. He is God, which is in Jerusalem. And whoever is left in any place where he dwells, let the men of his place help him with silver and gold, with goods and livestock, besides the free will offerings for the house of God. So this was a proclamation given by Cyrus. And it's in the Bible, but as you, when they found the Cyrus Cylinder, what astounded, and see, people doubted this, they, they just made this up, this never happened. So it's just all to support their narrative that there was a, a, um, uh, a captivity and then a, they were re able to return. And uh, when they began reading the Cyrus Cylinder, what they found was a proclamation not geared toward Jerusalem, but a, a proclamation that was very similar to what was written in the Bible. So it, it's, it seems that Cyrus may have written various proclamations depending on the particular location, and this just confirms what was written in the Bible, that it was authentic. So, you know, I think you, you know, you're going to have some, have some reading skills to me to read what's said on this cylinder. It may be clear to some, but it was very important. It was a very important find, which helps to support the, uh, what we find in Ezra chapter 1. We also know that uh, you, as you find these things in writing, it, they're very important to be able to decode languages. For instance, this is called the Rosetta Stone, uh, found by the French uh, in, in Napoleon's time. And, uh, and this, is, this was most important because people could not read the hieroglyphs. These are hieroglyphs here, the Egyptian writing. They had no clue how to read that. But when they found this, they found two forms of Greek here that they could understand, and, through understand, and, and the same thing was written in each section. Same thing, and, and it was, so it was written in hieroglyphics, Demotic Greek, and... Um, in the in, in ancient Greek, and by knowing one of the languages, then they could decipher the others. And this was a key, a breakthrough to understand standing the hieroglyphs in Egypt. So where now you, with that understanding, you could interpret what had been written on the various monuments and uh, the various things that you find in ancient Egypt. So this was a a, a, a tremendous find found in 1803. Uh, and it took the uh, linguist working, linguists working with this for 20 years to figure out the hieroglyphs. The next um, inscription here that's interesting, and there are many, I just picked three. And this is the Be Behistun uh, cliff, um, and, um, and this, this was uh, something that you had to, to be able to get to this, or to to put it up there in the first place, they had to hang down off the cliff. And uh, this is found on a, a road in uh, western uh, Iran. It was something that uh, Darius uh, the Great uh, had put, put up there 
uh, for posterity. And uh, so he had, a, had the, who is, his engravers, his uh, people that work with stone, climb down there and get this done. So uh, it was important to him, but uh, probably a dangerous assignment. And uh, probably you didn't want to misspell any of the words when you were uh, uh, at work there. So they, they did this, and uh, it's thought that it was, um, Darius was the one who uh, paid for this to be done. And, uh, and the, what's, what's the importance of this particular thing? The message that Darius wanted to be relayed was written in three languages. Uh, one of them was a cuneiform, and uh, they, could not, uh, they could not understand uh, cuneiform. Uh, that script they could not understand. So once they found this particular inscription, and the, the guy who actually deciphered the inscription, he, he hung down off that cliff, and he spent all that time up there writing it down so that they could take it back and then they could uh, uh, go through the process of figuring out what it said. As I said, the inscription includes three versions of the same text written in three different uh, cuneiform script languages, Old Persian, Elamite, and Babylonian. And uh, in effect, then the inscription is to cuneiform what the Rosetta Stone is to Egyptian hieroglyphs. So they were able to understand, you know, you have all these cuneiform tablets, they were able then to go back and be able to understand them. Which tells us a lot about the uh, uh, cultures of the time. Now, as you think about chronological dating, you know, you want to say, well, when was the Exodus? Well, we think it was 1446 B.C. And, well, what supports that? Or we think that Israel went into the land of, land of Canaan about 1400 B.C. Well, how do you know that? Or that David was a king in Israel about 1000 B.C. How do you know these things? Well, you've got to somehow find things that help to support that very idea. And you have to realize until recent times, they didn't even believe that there was a David or a house of David at all. It was all made up. But uh, anyway, what you're trying to do is establish a chronology and put things in an order. So you have relative dating. Basically, that's look, finding things, and you can at least say that one is older than the other. And that's good as far as it goes, but that's limited. It's a, you know, very, you know, you say, well, this related to that is older or younger, and you can put them in at least an older, younger position. Absolute dating is to go further than rel relative dating, dating, and you need other information that will help us to go further in the dating process. And the other data helps us to go from a relative date to an absolute one. And uh, that's uh, sometimes hard to, uh, to do. And uh, why is it hard to date? A fellow by the name of Paul Lapp said, after all the evidence of ancient history is so limited, in fact, we estimate that we may have one one thousandth of all the evidence that was originally available that has survived to our day. And we're trying to draw conclusions about what happened, when it happened, why it happened, based on one one thousandth of all the evidence that ever existed. You have just a thimbleful of all the evidence that might be out there, and you're trying to base everything on that. So, uh, like you said, we could be way off uh, on, on certain things. So how close can we get to uh, the correct date? Well, some things, we, as we put, bring multiple things to bear on a particular date, then we can get it to where it's pretty accurate. You know, other things, you're looking at maybe 25 to 50 years uh, that is about as close as you're going to be able to get to it uh, because you just can't pin it down uh, that clearly. Things we might use for dating, we have um, carbon dating, and uh, I could make a joke there, but I'm not. Things that we could use for dating, carbon dating, uh, and, and carbon dating is really good on things that are very ancient. I mean, way back there, we're looking at dinosaurs and all that kind of thing. But when you're trying to date something from maybe 3000 BC, 1800 BC, it's not very accurate. It could be off as much as uh, 300, uh, 175 years each way, so it's not the most accurate method we can use. 
Uh, so we've seen inscriptions are very helpful. And uh, we find many uh, documents in uh, Egypt and, and Greece. Uh, when you think about Israel, there aren't a lot of documents there. Uh, the, in Israel, you don't have a lot of documents because most of the documents were papyrus. And papyrus degenerates pretty fast unless the weather conditions are just right. Now, the weather conditions in ancient Israel are good for like the Dead Sea Scrolls because it's very dry there. But in other parts of the country, it's quite damp and, and paper just didn't, didn't uh, survive. Uh, that's, a, that's another reason why you have uh, you know, some of the uh, copies of the Bible that were written on papyrus and that kind of thing that survived in Egypt. And the reason is uh, you know, it's quite dry there and allowed them to be preserved. Coins. Uh, coins are also a way that you can date, but uh, they only go back to the 5th century for the most part. And, uh, and, uh, the, and coins, and you don't have coins in Palestine before the 5th century, and so for the most part, uh, most of the period we're interested in, there are no coins for dating. And coins tend to, uh, you know, if you, you have a coin, let's say that's a, a 1935 silver uh, mercury head dime, a lot of times you'll pass that along to somebody in your family. So what happens is, is you save them because of their value and they pass on from one generation to another and therefore they, they, if they're lost, they're lost in a different generation and confuse the whole matter. So you have to be careful with that as well as jewelry. Jewelry has the same problem. It's hard to date it, pinpoint the date of it uh, very, very carefully. So what's the main thing that they look to? It, uh, this fellow named Sir Flinders Petrie, he uh, began to look at pottery, and he, he developed uh, uh, the case for using pottery when he worked in Egypt and decided there was only one tool that can really make sense to use as a way to determine archaeological dates in Canaan, and that was pottery. And uh, pottery is one of the most common things, uh, most simple things to give chronological dates to certain levels uh, because potsards are quite common. And, um, to, and to serve as a dating tool, it has to uh, have certain char uh, characteristics. You have, have to find a lot of it. And, um, and, uh, and many times there's quite a bit of pottery in a, in a site that you're digging up. Uh, then you, the, and so hopefully you have enough of that to be able to make a date. Pottery is found just about everywhere in the Middle East. It was uh, widespread. You can't use something to date the level if it's gone. You need something that is guaranteed to survive to the date and level if, uh, to survive. And pottery can be broken, but it will be there. So you have, um, and uh, it has to change its form frequently because then you can say, well, this is older than that and you can see what that type of pottery was and make determinations about it. So um, they're able to, this really helped as far as dating things as they found pottery. And not only on pottery would you find the, the shards of pots, you'd also find writing on those shards of pot, pot, those shards of pottery. So they would help you as far as making determinations about a site as well. So when you think about archeology span in the Bible, you know, the Bible spans a period from the creation to about uh, 100 A.D. And during that span, a great deal of history took place. And we as Christians see the Bible as the truth. It's a book in which we can have confidence. But not everybody has that confidence. And when you begin to study into the history of the Bible and look at different things, you'll find people are not always that positive about uh, the, the scriptures and uh, what they have to say. I know that when I was in, co before I came into the church, I was taking a biblical prophets class because I had begun to find some, out something about the church. And I thought, well, this will be a good class. So I went into the class. And on the first day, the guy tells me he didn't really believe in the Bible. And I'm like, then what are you teaching this class for? So I lost confidence and I dropped that class and moved on. But that's typically, they're teaching you about the Bible when they don't believe in it. Now, they may, hold, you know, they may be willing to be open-minded in their approach, but you have to, have to be careful about that. Archaeology is a forensic science that allows us to probe ancient historical sites in order to verify what is laid out for us in the Bible. 
And there are still many people that are pursuing archaeology and seeking to confirm what the Bible has to say. For us, as discoveries are made, they tend to strengthen our faith as they show the Bible to be true. And next time, we'll examine some of those discoveries in order to see how they support the biblical narrative.